Welcome to Fruitland Fellowship, Christian Fellowship. We're in Fruitland, New Mexico. For those joining us online on Facebook, we're going through the Gospels, the harmony of the Gospels. All four Gospels, they work together. There's no contradictions in the Bible. If you ever find one, please send me an email. We've been studying it for a very long time, and 2,000 years, no one's been able to find a contradictory contradiction in the Bible. So uh, we're obviously going through uh, what Jesus said, and today um, marks one year. We actually started this study a year ago, and of course the ministry was about three and a half years. And it's interesting that today we're in section 50 at the second feast, uh, which was the second Passover. So it marks exactly one year in the first year of Jesus' public ministry, from the baptism of John until about now. That's kind of where we are in a chronological order, based on the book of Luke. And um, if you're ever in Fruitland, uh, we'd love for you to come join us. We're at 701 County Road 6100, and uh, right across from Golden's, we talked about that. It's a famous little gas station, and also the post. Is that the trading post on the other corner? All right, behind the post office. So here's our address, here's our phone number. If you have any questions, 505-374-8900, Fruitland Christian Fellowship at Gmail. We'd love to get in touch with us. So today, although we're looking at section uh, 50, it's John chapter 5. Who has the Bibles? What does the Bible stand for? The acronym Bible? Can anyone tell me? Basic Instructions for Leaving Earth. All right, there's no good to read it after you're out of here, but while you're here, it's a, that's your Emmanuel. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. So, John chapter 5 is uh, an amazing area of scripture. We'll be covering about 47 verses. If you want to read along, we suggest you to do that. Uh, or we have them on the screen for you as well. But uh, there's a key verse in this, uh, in this section where Jesus asked a man at the pool of Bethesda who was waiting for a miracle for many, many, many years. He asked him the first question, do you want to be made well? So that's a good question to ask anybody who's listening. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're struggling with, God, we really want to ask you, do, do you want to be made well? So we're going to talk about that, unpack that a little bit more. And uh, it's based on the harmony of the Gospels, the life of the Messiah from a Jewish perspective. We're going to cover a lot of reasons why Jesus did things on the Sabbath. And uh, a lot of things I didn't know because I'm not Jewish and I, I wasn't a Pharisee. And, um, but uh, basically, it's uh, this section he's talking about the Messiah's authority over the Sabbath. So it's sections 50 to 52. Sections 50 is a big section. It's again 47 verses, so we don't have time really for this one, and I'm probably going to have to fly through it. So before I pack into this, I just wanted to mention here that, again, um, what I didn't know, and it was even reminded this morning, that the Pharisees had the oral law, and from 220 A.D. to 500 A.D., after Jesus, they started writing it down. And up, up until then, rabbis would always teach orally, and they would repeat and repeat, and they would memorize things. So they didn't have copies of Bibles and copies of Scripture like we did. But the Mosaic Law, the 613 laws that Moses wrote down, and Pharisees and Sadducees started adding a fence around it, extra laws, to keep you from getting close to breaking the 613. It's a lot like our Constitution. We have our Constitution. And ever since then, the last 200 plus years, legislators keep adding, adding more and more laws and statutes and judgments, and now all of a sudden we're starting to violate some of the original constitutional principles, like the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. And they start writing laws that violate those original cases. So this is what Pharisees were doing. So again, the 613 laws um, by 30 and 50 AD, um, they had a bunch, they had the fence, and they were still trying to add more. They thought there were still holes in the fence that people were going to get close to breaking the law with the best of intention. And here's Jesus on the scene claiming to be the Messiah. He wasn't the first one to claim to be the Messiah. So again, now that he's proving that he is the Messiah, um, he would be, he's going to be doing things intentionally that Pharisees wrote in their law. The Pharisees are expecting him to affirm Pharisaic Judaism. And Sadducee Judaism. And there's a lot of different Christianities, a lot of sects in Christianity right now. Certain certain denominations focus on certain key pillars. So it even happens within the Christian church, I might say. But Jesus does a lot of things that are very intentional. And as we see in verse 1, we'll get read through the scriptures. So chapter 5, verse 1. 
And before we read, again, just attention is always good to pray before we start, right? So let's do that for those that are joining us online. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the life of your son, Jesus, for celebrating that every day. But again, as uh, the world celebrates the birth of the Messiah around Christmas time, we just want to say thank you for putting on flesh, um, coming here, teaching, dying on the cross, being raised back to life, and your promise to come back. So as we study your life and who you are and what you said, Holy Spirit, be the teacher. We pray this. Help us understand what we're reading. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Okay. So, John 5. After, the, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4, For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Verse 5. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? So pause your attention for a minute. So that's the question. What are you going through right now? What are you struggling with? Um, have you been in a place where you were praying for a breakthrough, you're praying for healing? We have some people in our congregation that we've been praying for healing, our brother Mike, right? And, uh, and uh, you know, Peter, we just talked about Peter, meaning, you know, people are going through some stuff. But imagine being sick with something for 38 years, paralyzed, and you're hanging out at this pool where it's been known to miracles that happen. When the angel stirs up the water, first one angel gets it. it sounds like a lottery, right? And here Jesus walks up to this man. He doesn't know who he is, and he doesn't require faith. So this stage in Jesus' ministry, the whole first year, Jesus is doing miracles without being asked. And he's also, he's not asking if they have faith in him. This guy doesn't even know who he is, and we'll see that later in the text. And he's doing these signs and wonders so people would start believing in him, knowing that he is the Messiah, claiming to be the Messiah, the promised one, the Holy One of Israel. So... If Jesus were to ask you, sometimes we get a lot of, a lot of uh, attention uh, being the victim or having it, uh, something go wrong. A lot of people will show attention because you've got some issues. And it's an attention here. And that could be addicting. That could be, um, I wouldn't say addicting, but there's value in that when people are always coming to help you. And, and if everything was made well, then all of a sudden, you know, it, even at the funerals, they would say, after 30 days after a funeral, the casserole parade stops. So when people go through a funeral, a lot of people cook food, they're bringing stuff over, you know, the family is mourning, and after a month, people get back to their normal way of life, and then the widow or the family, you know, the people stop calling as much, people stop visiting as much, and they're still hurting, they're still processing the loss. We call it the, the casserole parade stops coming by. So that's when people really start getting depressed, they really start missing that person because all the people that have been coming around extra time, you know, trying to comfort them and be their friend, um, kind of kept them occupied. And now all of a sudden it gets really, really lonely. Especially for widows if they lost their spouse and now they're, they're dealing with waking up every morning after how many years of being married and their spouse is gone. And it's just that, you know, it's like an amputation, you know, living with, without an arm for the rest of your life. So anyway, that, this is, I just think it's an interesting question. That the first thing out of Jesus' mouth, out of all the people there, he goes to one guy and asks him, do you want to be made well? So back to the scriptures, verse 7. The sick man answered, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered him, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Your attention please. So you're in the oral law. So on the Sabbath day, we all know that it's the fourth commandment, right? The fourth, it's one of those commandments that takes four, four sentences to explain, but it says six days do all your work. It doesn't mention anything about Saturday or Sunday. 
It says six days do all your work. On your seventh day, rest. It's a holy day unto the Lord. Right? So that's the commandment. They wrote 1,500 rules and regulations on what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath day. That was the oral law. That's what Pharisees had. And one of those laws was on the Sabbath, you can't carry anything from home to work or work to home. You can't carry stuff around. That's work. It's called legalism. And it's okay to be obedient to the word. It's okay to say, I'm not working today. It's my Sabbath day rest. That's not legalism. That's called obedience. And Jesus, at the end of the, after he ascends, he says, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. He commanded us to love one another. Love God, love people. But if you're on the way on your day off, or you see an old lady on the side of the road with a flat tire, and you stop and you break a sweat changing a tire, God is not mad at you. Okay? But they had 1,500, they jumped out of it just one 1,500 rules and regulations of things you can't do on a Sabbath. So again, the Pharisees, since Jesus after a year has been claiming to be the Messiah, the Pharisees are trying to see if he's going to affirm Pharisee, Pharisee Judaism, that type of Judaism. And he's purposely doing things now to show them, I'm not here to confirm your message, I'm doing something different. I'm, the original 613 laws, he kept perfectly, they're doable. But again, it's a runaway train when it comes to rules and regulations. So even with the best of intentions, right? So as a pastor in ministry, some will say, well, I will never be alone in a room with another woman because I don't want it looking funny. That's not a Bible verse. It's don't commit adultery, don't commit fornication, right? But some people will have a hedge of protection around their... They're, they'll make some extra rules to keep themselves above reproach or uh, having some woman accuse them of something, always having a witness around, right? So anyway, there's, again, some of the best of intentions. We come up with rules and regulations. But if you have a list, it's called legal list. If you have a list of things you can't do, and it may be, again, inspired by reading a verse and trying to keep some obedience, and that's how you're living it out. You make some rules for yourself. You call them boundaries. It's good to have boundaries to keep you from falling off the cliff. I'm not even going to get close to the edge, right? I'm going to stay away from the cliff. I mean, it's not a bad idea, but it can get crazy, and that's where, again, churches and Christianity, um, some churches are King James Version only. They're just so adamant about that's the only translation, and that was written in the 1600s. Jesus didn't use the King James Version only. They call them KJV churches, and they have some lists like, you know, girls can't wear slacks. They have to wear dresses and they have to be below the knee. I mean, those are just a couple things that they're adamant about. And, you know, just because there's a verse in the Old Testament that talks about women should wear men's clothing and men should wear women's clothing. So they've decided, well, what's men, men's clothing? So pants are for men, dresses are for women. They've determined that. They just said girls are only allowed to wear dresses. That's how they've interpreted that. But I believe it's more like cross-dressing. And there's a Bible verse for that. So. I know there's about 3% of the community that will be offended at this message, but LGBTQ and having the other letter you want is less than 3% of our population. And they have such a voice and such a platform now, if you speak against anything that they're, they're trying to affirm as good behavior, they call us phobic or hate speech, but I love you, but when you're wrong about something, I love you, I'll start with I love you, I'll tell you I love you. If you thought one plus one equals three, the most loving thing I can do is teach you that. Here, let me show you. Here's one. Here's another one. Now, Adam, one, two, two. It's not three. You would think it's three, but let me show you it's two. And if you do that the right way, with love, you can correct people. You can't let people just run with deception. That's the whole textbook definition of deception. Is they think they're right, but they've been deceived into believing a, a lie is true. Right? So... Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. So lovingly, we have to talk about some things. And again, we're not judging certain topics. God already judged it. He has an opinion about everything in the Bible, including marriages between a man and a woman. And when you even ask Jesus about divorce, he says, haven't you read? In the beginning, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a male shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Nothing's changed there. That's the combination. But he starts off with very nicely. Have you read? In the beginning, God created them male and female. So if there's a population out there trying to cause gender confusion 
I'm not going to affirm that. And I love him, and I just have to say, the first question when a baby's born is what? Was it a boy or a girl? We have science. This is scientific chromosome stuff. Right? We love you guys, but it's not for the child to decide when he gets older whether he wants to be a boy or a girl. So it's not how you feel. It's we deal with facts more than feelings. Sometimes feelings line up with facts, but sometimes feelings don't necessarily confirm facts. So anyway, here we are on a Sabbath day, and the Jews are asking, "What are you doing walking around? Here's a guy who's been paralyzed for 38 years, and somebody's going to bust his chops about why are you carrying your mat today? You should have been out throwing a party. You've been healed for 38 years. You can carry your mat. This is amazing. Wow, let's, let's praise God. Let's have a party." And they're, they're, they're giving them a hard time about carrying, breaking one of their rules. So this is just classic Jesus. So, you know, you know and he, and he, he just brings up the topic of conversation. So back to the text. Verse 12. And they asked him, who is this man? Capital M. Jesus always gets, a, as a pronoun, God always gets a capital. Who is this man said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. So it wasn't he had faith in Jesus, it wasn't he asked Jesus, and asked him, you know, he was just waiting around where miracles happen, looking for God to show up in his life, and Jesus shows up and, and face to face, for Jesus had withdrawn and the multitude being in that place. Verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest something worse, a worse thing come upon you. Pause your attention here. So. So now, again, he's healed. He didn't know who it was. They asked him who did it. He said, I don't know. So now all of a sudden he finds himself in church. Temple. He's in the temple. Great place to be. If I was healed, healed of being paralyzed through eight years, I'd be a church goer right away too, right? So here he is in church. And now Jesus comes to him up to him again a second time and says, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. I always found that interesting. Like, knock it off. I don't know what this guy's doing. He doesn't get specific. But he got the healing. And sometimes people keep sinning. People want their Savior and their sin too. That's the number one thing that keeps people from coming to Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 3. We read it a few months ago. This is the verdict. God's all of the world. He gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him, trusts in him, obeys in him, has everlasting life. That's what that word believes in. And will not perish, that's hell. So everlasting life, heaven, perish, is hell. And he says, you know, God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the Son, but that through him they might be saved. And he goes on to say, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. And they won't come into the light in fear that their evil deeds will be exposed. So most people know in their spirit, in their conscience, coming to Jesus means I need to give up some things. It's not right with God. That's, that's the one thing that keeps people away from God, is knowing that I want to do this, and I know it's a sin, which means missing the mark. It's not, it's not God's will for your life. And everybody has a sin of choice. In the drug world, we call it drug of choice. Some people it's alcohol, some people it's heroin, crack, meth, you know, opioids. We just got done watching this movie called Dope Sick. It's on Hulu. If you've never seen it before, it's an eight-hour, eight-part series, one hour each about how... Uh, the Purdue Pharmaceutical Company introduced Oxycontin in 1996 and said that less than 1% of the people get addicted to it. And within three years, it changed communities. People were breaking into pharmacies, stealing Oxycontin. It is off the charts addiction. And um, there's a whole story between the FDA and pharma and, and the sales reps just pushing it. And it's, it's heartbreaking. But it's true. I mean, the bottom line is there are some pharmaceuticals that are good for you, but the narcotics and pain medication is highly addictive. And you know, doctors, lawyers, any of our profession, anybody with any kind of pain can easily become addicted to this stuff, right? So that's the world that we live in. But when God does a healing in your life, it's, you know, it's an attention here. He's trying to get your attention. And it's time to, to grow up and fly right. Straighten up and fly right, okay? So you know, Paul would say, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, but now I put childish things away, I became a man, right? So it's time to grow up, it's time to be obedient, it's time to... Walk in a way that's pleasing to God and the people around you and to be a blessing. So I just thought that was interesting that, like, you know, Jesus didn't give him a high five or whatever. He's like, see, you may well make sure you go sin no more, unless something worse happens to you. And he's, it's not like it's, Jesus isn't saying here, or God's going to get you. That's not what he's saying. A lot of times, sin has consequences. If you throw a bunch of rocks in the air, what are they going to do? They're going to come down and hit somebody. 
And I also say when you talk about certain topics in a group of people, if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the hit one always howls. <laughs> so when we talk about truth, you know, like certain sins of choice, somebody in, in the audience or somebody who's watching online may know somebody who's struggling, and they go, I don't know, judge. Well, that word judge means don't condemn them to hell. We're not condemning anybody. And we're going to get into that. Jesus has the authority to do that. We're discerning right from wrong. Dark from light, left from right, up from down, front to back, north, south, east, west. We're using discernment to discern. God gives us the brain to discern right from wrong. And that's, that's discernment. You didn't, that's not judging. Now, if you're making people, if you're, if you're adding, if you don't stop this, you're going to hell. Now, that's the judgment you're supposed to stay away from. God's the one who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And I'm just here for the record to say it's not a performance issue. We don't go to hell for doing wrong things. We go to hell for rejecting God, rejecting Messiah. And if you have a right relationship with God, He'll help you stop doing those wrong things. But sometimes that's even a process, breaking habits, and that's a whole other sermon. So anyway, we're encouraged to sin no more. Jesus isn't licensed to sin. So it's not like, okay, I'm saved. He's going to forgive me. I can keep doing what I'm doing. A lot of people make those three little connections, and that's just bad theology. God loves you the way you are, but He loves you so much He's not going to keep you the way you are. You're going to be changed from the inside. It's the inside out. It's a, it's a process, so we need to be patient with each other as we go through that. All right, back to the verses, verse 15. Then the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, verse 18, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he's not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered him and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, but whatever he does, the son also does in this manner. For your attention, please. They didn't catch this until I listened to Arnold from a Jewish messianic perspective. Back in Exodus, the Son of Man was considered the nation of Israel. So up until now, the Jews would pray, Our Father, Our Father, Our Father. And Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, right? Hallowed be your name. So it's the we. Everywhere in Scripture, they're always praying to Our Father, Our Father. But I never saw it until they went over the notes. That Jesus here says, my father is working. There's a singular word there. So he's not saying our father, he's saying my father. And the Jewish people conclude that and from the Hebrew scriptures that he's saying, he's saying it's his father, he's equal with God. And he's going to go on from here and explain why he has the authority that, he, that you are talking to God. Because there's some things and we'll, 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 we'll do a summation after this and kind of go over that. But that's why, so here we all know that God made everything in six days, and on the seventh day He rested, right, as a pattern for us. That's why the fourth commandment is, six days do all your work, seven day rest. That's what God did. And God only took one day off, and He's been working ever since. So here's a revelation for you. God's still working, and it is a part for you to be playing in the body of Christ. You have, if, the, if this was a giant parade, you have a part in the parade. It could be the girl in the front twirling the baton, it could be the guy at the end of the parade sweeping up after all the elephants and horses. Somebody's got to do that, right? But there's all these positions, and there's the band, all the people in the marching band, and right, I mean, everybody should have made Day Parade, Thanksgiving Parade. A lot of people it takes to put on a parade, including the camera crew and everybody else who's broadcasting. So the body of Christ are all these people, and we're so used to watching the spokesperson do all the talking. And that's like the preacher or the pastor. We're always seeing him do all the talking. But the body of Christ, all these body parts working together to get some things accomplished. So basically, Jesus is saying, my father's always working, I'm always working. I am the Lord. I am the Lord God Almighty. I am, I, you know, so he's going to want to unpack this a little bit. But just think about this. This is, another, this is another proof that a day is not a million years or a billion years. It's just not. Because God is not going to not do something for a million years or a billion years. Can you imagine God not doing anything for that long? It probably took him, it was, I would say it was hard for God because there's nothing too hard for the Lord. But for God to rest for seven days and do nothing, and he's always creating, he's the creator. So that was the, he did that. I once heard a preacher say, God created everything in six days, what took him so long? He could have done it like that. He could have said, instead of let there be light, he could have said, let there be everything else. 
boom, and everything would have been as is, functioning, gone on. But he slowed himself down and did certain things, one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, six days. We were made on the six days along with cattle, right? Except the fifth day was all the birds and all the fish. The fourth day was the sun, the stars, and all the moon. Why do we need the stars and the sun on, on day four? Because you just got done making grass and trees on day three. What do grass and trees need? Sunlight. So that's another proof that it wasn't a million billion years for a day. Because grass and trees on day three couldn't wait a million years for the sun to appear. And that was the proof that on day one he said, let there be light. It wasn't a star and it wasn't a candle and it wasn't the sun. It was God himself. He is light. So, and then he started making all those other things. So, as, and again, it all goes back to what God spoke through Moses in the commandments and in the scriptures. Jesus affirms everything that Moses wrote. So this isn't fiction, and this isn't fairy tale stuff. He talks about what Moses said and what Moses did as fact. So he's, you know, he said, so that's where we're at. Back to verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things that he himself is doing. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the, the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Verse 23, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So now he's unpacking your attention, please. He's unpacking, you're talking to God. Only God can judge? Now he's claiming that the Messiah is the Son of Man, the Son of God, I can judge too, because me and my Father are equal. God gives life to the resurrection. God, the resurrection, now he's going to start talking about the resurrection and how he has the authority over the resurrection. You're talking to God. So this is like, this is like in your face. If I was giving you this speech, telling you God can raise the resurrection, and I'm the Son of God, and I can do the resurrection, I'm like, I would have a hard time with this, with this speech too. I mean, somebody who looks like a man, so he's, he's proven I'm the Messianic God-man. He's God and he's also man. It's in the mystery of the Trinity. 100% God, 100% man. So you see him doing things men do, but you also see him, and he's explaining supernatural stuff like judging. He has authority to judge, and he also has authority over the resurrection. Verse 24, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, some direct translations say truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, talking about himself, and those who hear will live. Check this out. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man, which was prophesied over 1,500 years, 300 plus different ways, and over 39 different books of the Old Testament. So the verse 28, do not marvel at this. Don't go, you know, you blow your brain. Don't let your brain break over this. Don't marvel over this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can do nothing, I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So again, I was unpacking the Trinity, your, your, your attention here. So there is going to be a final resurrection, and that new spiritual body that lives forever is either going to live in the lake of fire, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Souls and spirits don't have teeth and you don't have eye ducts to, to, for, for tears. And then those who, who believe and are saved will have the resurrection of life. So every time you drive by a, a graveyard, I want you to think of Matthew 28 and 29. Those who come forth and done good to the resurrection of life, those who are not evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So there's going to be a separation. That's why we're fascinated with the, with, with the you know, zombie games and the Michael Jackson Thriller album where people come up out of the graves and they start doing choreography and skeletons and Halloween and all that kind of stuff. There's some kind of internal truth that God has put in us that there's going to be a resurrection day. Even Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 talks about um, the dust becoming back to life and getting a new body. It's a resurrection verse in Daniel. It's all through 
uh, the hope of the resurrection. So again, Jesus is saying, you've been reading about the resurrection, and I have authority over the resurrection. You're going to hear my voice, because he is God who's in on it. And this is every cult that you, that you would recognize as a cult, and I'll even name one, like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, they don't believe in the deity of Jesus. This stuff right here, they wouldn't know what to do with these verses if you kind of explain it. So uh, in John 10, 30, me and my father are one. So in John 14, 6, 7, and 8, when he says, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to me. Uh, let's, you know, uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he says, show me the Father. And in verse 8, and it was Thomas, and he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what do you do with that verse? All right, so this is the mystery of the Trinity that we all, you know, a, a true Christian denomination, you know, hangs their head on. So verse 31. Now he starts talking about the fourfold witness, and again, a biblical proof, the principle from day one is let everything be established by two or three witnesses. So now he starts talking about the witnesses to his Messiahship. If I bear witness of myself, verse 31, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have said to John, he's talking about John the Baptist, uh, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. Verse 35. He was the burning and shining lamp, talking about John the Baptist. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which that the Father has given you to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. Your attention, please. So we just got that. Raising a paralyzed guy, you see it recently, he cleansed lepers, and nobody's ever cleansed a leper from the Old Testament all the way up until now. And the Pharisees and Sadducees would even say, when the Messiah comes, he'll be able to cleanse leprosy. And then on the books was, if a man was born blind, and how to do that, and he's about ready in John chapter 5 to, to heal a man born blind the way he wanted to do it, not the way they can't do it. Again, they was always saying that the Messiah, no one's ever been able to do this stuff before. There's been a lot of amazing miracles. Elijah and, and they've all done some things. But now Jesus is starting to do things nobody's ever done before. So the signs and the wonders and the miracles are affirming that he is the Son of Man, the, the Savior of the world. And, uh, you know, he's on, he's on display at this point. Verse 37. And the Father himself, who sent me, and has testified to me, you have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So your attention please. Now he's pointing to the scriptures. So here's Pharisees, Sadducees. You know, they have copies of the scrolls in the temple. They're reading them, and they're interpreting them into this Pharisaic Judaism. And they think that, that they're righteous, because they've interpreted what Moses said, and, and Jesus is not affirming all this extra nonsense, the runaway religion that they've turned it into. And so they're not coming to him. They haven't received him as Messiah. And he's saying, these scriptures talk about me, all these Messianic prophecies. They're not willing to come to me. It's like, it's like you can read a story about somebody and then finally meet that person. You're so stuck in the story that you're ready. You're like, dude, that, you just read my biography. Hi, nice to meet you. I had a biography read about me. And now you get to meet the person that you read about. It's kind of the same thing going on here. Like, you're reading the Bible about God and his son, that's the Messiah that's coming. And now he's in town and they're thinking he's not it, he's not it, he's not it because he's not really giving us the thumbs up on our religion. You know, he's trying to bring it back to just a pure... Mosaic Judaism, true Judaism, the way the Hebrew Bible described it. So, again, Jesus had a lot of hard times with religious leaders and political leaders. And so do we, rightly so. Because sometimes we, it turns into a freak show. There's an old saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And man, you give people a little bit of power, and they just get, they, they, you know, they start controlling people. We're not meant to be controlled by anybody, right? So that's why we see a lot of struggle right now. And a lot of people debating over positions, policies, because government overstreet, overreach. We've seen a lot of that this last year or two. Government overreach and political, or even you know, um, just false uh, teachers and, and 
there's some other documentaries we've been watching about some guys who, uh, was it David Brown or uh, Jones? David Jones? Um, you made everybody drink the Kool-Aid, but you yeah. Tim Jones. So there's a documentary on uh, Hulu that I was watching. I was like, man, I can't. And they just, the, the book is kind of like, I can't believe they were full of this. Some of the things that he was on recording saying and doing, and then he went all, all the way out to uh, Ghana and he didn't talk everybody into committing suicide, drinking this poison. 900 people in this block willingly took poison to kill themselves. And talk about a cult leader leading a whole group of people astray. And it, all, it was all around the civil civil rights thing, because it was such a hot, lit topic, civil rights movement, that people were flocking to him because some of the things he was saying was attractive because of you know this whole civil rights movement, but it wasn't biblical. Anyway, I just say that because, again, religious leaders, you've got to be careful. Jesus, you'll see in the scriptures, would come across uh, Bereans. And he would compliment the Bereans because they would listen to the teaching and they would go compare it to the Word. To see if what you're teaching is lining up with the word. So I say that to anybody who's listening. I mean, I'm, I'm not perfect up here. We try to do the best we can with what we know. We, we look at the scriptures. We try to unpack it. But it's very possible I can have a couple mistakes. There's not a perfect servant out there. So you know, I'm a God grades them at the end of the, the day. You know, got 89 high school teachers. You know, got great papers, right? So nobody's got 100 percent perfect sermon going on except Jesus. The sermon on the mount that was a perfect sermon. So we'll close this up. 45. And I think that. I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So now he's you know, again going up against toe to toe with some of these Pharisaic leaders. So here's Messiah's defense. One, he's doing the works of the Father, 19 through 21. The Son will judge all men, verses 22 to 23. He has the power to provide the eternal life. Only God can do that. He says, I have you, I can give eternal life in verse 24. He will bring about the resurrection of the dead in verse 25. See, these are things that only they knew God, the creator of God, would do. Now he's saying the Son of Man has the authority to do that to us inside. And then the, the Messiah's witness, the fourfold witness we talked about earlier. He mentions John, the baptism of John, and you know, verse 33, how when, when he got baptized, John bore witness and said, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that was John bearing witness about Jesus. And Jesus said, I don't even need that. My works speak for what I'm doing. His miracles, verse 36. He's saying, The works that I do prove I am who I am. And then God the Father, verse 37. And then the scriptures talk about me. And uh, he's talking about Moses wrote about me. You say you believe Moses, but you, know, you turn what Moses said into something else. And here I am face to face, and you still don't get it. So here's kind of what we were talking about. I want to show this slide because Arnold does a really good job. So here's the Torah, 613 laws Moses wrote up throughout Leviticus, right? So the Sofrim, which is a Sofer, uh, they started writing these um, from 450 B.C. So that's after the book of Malachi. From 450, it was the last Old Testament book. It was 400 years of nothing, no new scripture until Matthew, the book of 30 B.C. when Matthew, when Jesus starts showing up on the scene. So that's called the, 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 the Tanium or Tan. So then they started trying to, that's like a fence. You're trying to build a fence around the 613 laws so we don't get close to, if the, the rule was don't go swimming, well, we're going to build a fence around the school so you don't even get close to get your foot in the water if you're not allowed to go swimming. So then they tried to put more, more holes, or more, there was holes in the fence. So from 30 B.C. to 220 A.D., and again, it's still oral. It didn't have anything written until then. So 220 A.D. is a, um, is a, a mora. So they started adding more laws. So the first, the, the Sofran is about a thousand, thousand words of fine print. And they say, um, the, when they started to add more to it, the memoriam is about the size of the encyclopedia. So 500 A.D., it went from a thousand word document the, uh, an Encyclopedia Britannica set. So you can imagine how many books and volumes were in the Encyclopedia. So, and all of that um, turns into the Mishnah and Gemara. So the Mishnah was the first thousand that the Gemara was well, the, the Encyclopedia Britannica set of all these additional laws, rules, and regulations, of which there was 1,500 about just the Sabbath. And it was, um, we'll, we'll go on to the next section. So the whole thing is considered to call it the Talmud. And that's what the Jewish rabbis would refer to. So again, that's why there's just a, a lot of 
even in Israel, there's just all these different sects of Judaism and then what we call Messianic Jews. So when a Jewish person comes to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, we call them a completed Jew, a Messianic Jew, because, you know, a lot happened uh, 2,000 years ago. It's like, I always say Rocky 1, Rocky 2, Rocky 3, Rocky 4, Rocky 5. Right? If you just read Rocky 1, and that's that's the only that's, that's like the first one books in the Bible. Is, you know, so that's just a little heads of more movies that came out to finish the rest of the story. Now you got Creed one and Creed two, right? With uh, you know Creed son. So there's more to the story, and some people just are stuck in the first the first part of the book. Anyway, so here we have uh, we're still doing free and deep on Wednesday nights, um, six to seven, and um, yeah, I was going to put up a closing sound, but I did. So let's close in prayer and move into some fellowship. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you that you are true and you do give life to those who call upon your name and forgiveness of sins in your name. Thank you that uh, eternal life uh, is guaranteed because of what you did. And uh, we just thank you that by faith and faith alone, by grace and faith, we are saved. And because of that, you've given us good works to do. I thank you as a church we can huddle up and, and, and strategize as you lead us what we ought to do next uh, from over fellowship to with this property to even outreaches uh, we believe that you're getting us ready because you're doing some big things in this in this city as well as the nation right next door uh, to have a nation so we lift up them as a people group and uh, our friends our family who do not yet know you we're praying you right now for divine appointments to share good news with them I pray that there would be a great harvest. And as you said, Lord Jesus, the harvest is right, laborers are few. So we pray that you would continue to show us how to raise up workers, laborers, to go out into the vineyard and, um, and share the good news that you, that you shared with us, that we would have more sheep and goats when you come back. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Very good.